Welcome back to DJX Chronicles. This one is facts concerning the late Arthur German and his family. It was written by H.P. Lovecraft back in 1920. It is a story of tainted ancestry, and it was originally published in 1921. So, uh, thank you all so much for watching, and here's part one. Life is a hideous thing. And from the background behind what we know of its pure demo demono demonical hint of truth, which make it something sometimes a thousandfold more hideous. Science, already oppressive with its shocking revelations, will perhaps be the ultimate exterminator of our human species. If separate species we be. For its reserve of unguessed horrors could never be born of mortal brains, if loosed upon the world. If we knew what we are, we should do as Sir Arthur German did. And Arthur German soaked himself in oil and set fire to his clothing one night. Maybe that's why I want to set myself on fire all the time. Anyway. I'm always saying that. Anybody who doesn't know me, I'm always saying I want to set myself on fire. No one placed the charred fragments in an urn or set a memorial to him who had been for certain papers and a certain box object were found. Which made men wish to forget. Some who knew him do not admit that he ever existed. Arthur German went out on the moor and burned himself after seeing the boxed object which had come from Africa. It was an object, and not his peculiar personal appearance, which made him end his life. Many would have disliked to live if possessed of the peculiar features of Arthur German, but he had been a poet and a scholar and had not minded. Learning was in his blood, for his great-grandfather, Sir Robert German, B.T., had been an anthropologist of note, whilst his great-great-great-grandfather, uh, Sir Wade German, was one of the earliest explorers of the Congo region, and had written eruditely of its tribes, animals, and supposed antiquities. Indeed, old Sir Wade had possessed an intellectual zeal amounting almost to a mania. His bizarre conjectures on a prehistoric white Congolese civilization earning him much ridicule in his book Observations on the Several Parts of Africa was published. In 1765, this fearless explorer had been placed in a madhouse at Huntingdon. Madness was all in oh, oops. Madness was in all the Germans, and people were glad there were not many of them. The line put forth no branches, and Arthur was the last of it. If he had not been, one cannot say what he would have done when the object came. The Germans never seemed to look quite right. Something was amiss, though Arthur was the worst. And the old family portraits of, in German house showed fine faces enough before Sir Wade's time. Certainly the madness began with Sir Wade whose wild stories of Africa were at once the delight and terror of his few friends. It showed in his collection of trophies and specimens, which were not such as a normal man would accumulate and preserve, and appeared strikingly in the oriental seclusion in which he kept his wife. The latter, he had said, was the daughter of a Portuguese trader, whom he had met in Africa, and did not like English ways. She was, with an infant son born in Africa, had accompanied him back from the second and longest of his trips, and had gone with him on the third and last 
never returning. No one had ever seen her closely, not even the servants, for her disposition had been violent and singular. During her brief stay at German House, she occupied a remote wing, and was waited on by her husband alone. Sir Wade was indeed most peculiar in his solicitude for his family, for when he returned to Africa, he would permit no one to care for his young son, save a loathsome black woman from Guinea. Upon coming back after the death of Lady German, he himself assumed complete care of the boy. But it was the talk of Sir Wade, especially when in his cups, which chiefly led his friends to deem him mad. In a rational age like the 18th century, it was unwise for a man of learning to talk about wild sights and strange scenes under a Congo moon. Of the gigantic walls and pillars of a forgotten city crumbling in vine grown and of damp, silent stone steps leading interminably down into the darkness of abysmal treasure vaults and inconceivable catacombs. Especially was it unwise to rave of the living things that might haunt such a place, of creatures half of the jungle and half of the impiously aged city, fabulous creatures which even a plain which even a Pliny might describe with skepticism. Things that might have sprung up after the great apes had overrun the dying city with the walls and the pillars. The vaults and the weird carvings. Yet, after he came home for the last time, Sir Wade would speak of such matters with a shuddering, uh, with a shudderingly uncanny zest mostly after his third glass at the knight's head, boasting of what he had found in the jungle, and of how he had dwelt among terrible ruins known only to him. And finally, he had spoken of the living things in such a manner that he was taken to the madhouse. He had shown little regret when shut into the barred room at Huntington for his mind moved curiously. Ever since his son had commenced to grow out of infancy, he had liked his home less and less, till at last he had seemed to dread it. The knight's head had been his headquarters, and when he was confined, he expressed some vague gratitude as if for protection. Three years later, he died. Way German son, Philip, was a highly peculiar person. Despite a strong physical resemblance to his father, his appearance and conduct were in many particulars so coarse that he was universally shunned. Though he did not inherit the madness which was feared by some, he was densely stupid and given to brief periods of uncontrollable violence. In frame, he was small, but intensely powerful, and was of incredible agility. Twelve years later, after succeeding to his title, he married the daughter of his grant gamekeeper, a person said to be of gypsy extraction, but before his son was born, joined the navy as a common sailor, completing the general disgust which his habits and misalliance had begun. After the close of the American War, he was heard of as a sailor on a merchantman in the African trade. Having a kind of reputation for feats of strength in climbing, but finally disappearing one night as his ship lay off the Congo coast. In the son of Sir Philip German, the now accepted family peculiarity took a strange and fatal turn. 
tall and fairly handsome, with a sort of weird eastern grace, despite certain slight oddities of proportion. Robert German began life as a scholar and investigator. It was he who first studied scientifically the vast collections of relics which his mad grandfather had brought from Africa. and who had made the family name as celebrated in ethnology as in exploration. In 1815, Sir Robert married a daughter of the 7th Viscount Brightholm, and was subsequently blessed with three children, the eldest and the youngest of whom were never publicly seen on account for deformities in mind and body. Saddened by these family misfortunes, the scientists sought relief in work, and made two long expeditions in the interior of Africa. In 1849, his second son, Neville, a singularly repellent person, who seemed to combine the surlines of Philip German with the hotter of the Brightholms, ran away with a vulgar dancer, but was pardoned upon his return in the following year. He came back to the German house, a widower with an infant son. Alfred, who was one day to be the father of Arthur German, friends said that it was this series of griefs which unhinged the mind of Sir Robert German, yet it was probably merely a bit of African folklore which caused the disaster. The elderly scholar had been collecting legends of the Ong tri oh, Onga tribe near the field of his grandfather's and his own explorations. Hoping in some way to account for Sir Wade's wild tales of the lost city peopled by strange hybrid creatures. A certain consistency in the strange papers of his ancestor suggested that the madman's imagination might have been stimulated by native myths. On October 19, 1852, the explorer Samuel Seton called at German House with a manuscript of notes collected among the Ongas, believing that certain legends of a gray city of white apes ruled by a white god might prove valuable to the ethnologist. In his conversation, he probably supplied many additional details, the nature of which will never be known, since a hideous series of tragedies suddenly burst into being. When Sir Robert German emerged from his library, he left behind the stapled corpse. Oh. He left behind the strangled corpse of the explorer and before he could be restrained, had put an end to all three of his children. The two who were never seen, and the son who had run away. Neville German died in the successful defense of his own two-year-old son, who had apparently been included in the old man's madly murderous scheme. Sir Robert himself, after repeated attempts at suicide and a stubborn refusal to utter an articulate sound, died of apoplexy in the second year of his confinement. Sir Alfred German was a baronet before his first fourth birthday, but his taste never matched his title. At 20, he had joined a band of music hall performers and at 36 had deserted his wife and child to travel with an in an itinerant American circus. His end was very revolting. Among the animals in the exhibition with which he traveled with a, was a huge bull gorilla of lighter color than the average, a surprisingly tractable beast of much popularity with the performers. With this gorilla, Alfred German was singularly fascinated, 
and on many occasions, the two would eye each other for long periods through the intervening bars. Eventually, German asked and obtained permission to train the animals. Astonishing audiences and fellow performers alike with his success. One morning in Chicago, as the gorilla and Alfred German were rehearsing an exceedingly clever boxing match, the former delivered a blow of more than usual force, hurting both the body and dignity of the amateur trainer. Of what followed, members of the greatest show on earth do not like to speak. They did not expect to hear Sir Alfred German emit a shrill, inhuman scream, or to see him seize his clumsy antagonist with both hands, dash it to the floor of the cage, and bite fiendishly at its hairy throat. The gorilla was off its guard, but not for long, and before anything could be done by the regular trainer, the body which had belonged to a baronet was past recognition. Okay, I'm taking a break really quick. It's part two.